You've just bought yourself a new aerial. You're anxious to get it working. But you put it up and it doesn't work. Is it faulty? Well, perhaps not. Hello and welcome once again to the Waters and Stanton video channel. I'm glad you could join me. Antennas, don't you love them? Don't you hate them when they go wrong? We couldn't do without them, but we like them to be working. You know, I've been fiddling about with antennas for years. I've got a copy of Practical Wireless here. This is May 1965, yeah, 1965. And it would have cost you two shillings quite sure what that is now. Sounds pretty cheap anyway. Two shillings. The reason I've still got this copy is because it was an, art an article in there which I wrote in 1965. It was an antenna article about um, an inverted L. Quite interesting actually that it was an inverted L antenna but you fed it from the end and the other end that so was outside it was terminated uh, to the ground. So in other words it was a uh, an inverted L, but fed in the opposite way with the far end grounded. <laughs> I'll have to read it sometime and catch up on it. But anyway, it seemed a good idea at the time and I think it worked quite well. Anyway, that's not the uh, point of this video. The point of this video really is to cover antennas and what you do when you seem to have a faulty antenna. Because it is really infuriating. You spend some good money on an antenna it arrives and you plug it in and it doesn't seem to work. Well, I always work on the premise that the chances are, the chances are that it probably is okay. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you haven't got a faulty antenna, but if you work on the premise that probably it's not faulty, then you can go through a series of tests to find out whether it is faulty. I hope you're following me on this one. <laughs> in other words, if you fold your arms and say, well, it's not working, it's faulty, uh, I'm going to send it back. You actually don't know at that point whether maybe, maybe there's something that you've done wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few pointers that you can check out before you finally decide to send your antenna back. Now, the first thing to do is to <laughs> check. Check the obvious and I have to put my hand up and say I did this recently actually. I switched on the transceiver and I had a new aerial and nothing. No signals, nothing. And for a few minutes I thought well it's got to be perhaps the cables faulty or something's happened outside. We had some windy weather and I suddenly realised that I had selected the um, antenna socket that was not terminated. The transceiver I was using at the time had two antenna sockets on it. Um, and I must have changed it over at some time. And inadvertently, um, I got the antenna socket um, in socket number two and I selected socket number one. So there we are. Even somebody that's been messing about with antennas for what, 60 odd years, can still make some very stupid mistakes. So there we are. So the next thing you need to check is the plugs because it is not unknown and it's happened many times over the years where uh, the report is that the antenna is faulty and it turns out that the plug on the cable was the part that was faulty. If you've got no signals at all then the chances of the antenna being faulty is not that great really because it suggests there's an open circuit and the most likely cause of an open circuit is on the feeder cable so you need to check the plugs at each end of the uh, coax cable and for that you need a test meter a simple test me meter to check whether there's an open circuit or not um, I'll come back to that in a minute actually. 
there is a problem that I've seen, and I'm not sure whether it still occurs, particularly on the VHF, UHF verticals. Diamond, uh, for a period of time, used no insulation on the socket between the outer, uh, the outer metal ring and the inner receptacle. And those, those receptacles, the, 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 the pins or receptors that take the PL259, they can be splayed out because there's no, they've got, they haven't got any support. And if they're splayed out, if you're sort of messing around with the plug and push it around, you might splay them out and you can get an open circuit. So it's worth looking at the socket just to make sure that that center receptor um, that pin is intact. Now let's go back to our test meter. Assuming that uh, you can't see anything wrong with the plugs, it's still worth checking for a short circuit. So you have your little test meter here, and it's worth getting one of these. You haven't got a test meter, and it costs about four or five pounds. Don't need to spend a lot of money on it. Just need to find out whether um, the circuit is open or continuous. So put that across your center and outer sheath, and provided that the far end of the cable is not connected to the antenna, you should see an open circuit. In other words, there should be no, no continuity at all. The reason I say make sure the cable is disconnected is because some antenna designs do have a coil which is either used for matching or, or, or getting rid of um, uh, RF um, buildup on the antenna, static buildup on the antenna. So on some antennas you can measure a short circuit, DC short circuit. Make sure that cable is disconnected. So we've, we've checked for our short circuit, but it could be open circuit. Now, some will say, well, wait a minute, my cable is down the garden about, I don't know, 20 metres, 30 metres away. I've buried it under the ground. How can I check whether there is continuity? Well, it's quite easy, actually. You don't have to rip up all that cable. Here we are, that's what I'm looking for. All you need is a dummy load. Put that dummy load into the cable at the antenna end. In other words, connect that dummy load to the cable at the far end. And then put your meter across the inner and outer conductors at your transceiver end, and you should be able to measure something around about 50 ohms. If you can measure something around about 50 ohms, then you haven't got an open circuit. If, on the other hand, you measure nothing, then you have got an open circuit. Simple. Good idea, though. Now, an antenna is basically a mechanical device. And if there are going to be problems on the antenna, it's almost certainly going to be a mechanical problem. Sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's not. I'm assuming that when you connect the antenna, you have got some sort of signal because if you haven't, there is something really, really wrong. So if you connect the antenna and you can hear signals, then we need to take a closer look at what actually is going wrong and what makes you think the antenna's faulty. Maybe you've got a, a, a VSWR that is high, higher than you'd expect. Maybe it's not quite as low as you would expect. Now, it's quite interesting, this, because a lot of people expect the VSWR to be unity, 1.1, 1.2 to 1. Well, in antenna real life, that doesn't often happen. If you can get a VSWR of around about 1.5, 1.6, that's more than acceptable. It's not going to make a heap of the difference to your signal, either receiving or transmitting. Getting a 1.1 or 1.2 is a nice thing to see but it's probably only going to be achieved when you put the ATU in circuit and that's another thing when you're checking an antenna do not have the antenna in circuit uh, the antenna tuner in circuit if it's a coaxial design don't have the ATU in circuit make sure the ATU is switched out so you're actually seeing the actual VSWR on the antenna if it's a VSWR problem, there's certain things that you can do before you phone up the dealer and say you've got a problem, because these things will help 
the dealer to perhaps understand what's going wrong. If you've got a multi-band antenna, then check the VSWR on each band and check it at three points. Now, um, you can use the internal VSWR meter of your transceiver or you can purchase an external one. The advantage of having an external VSWR meter is that then it doesn't matter whether you've got your ATU in circuit or not because that meter is going to be on the other side is going to be on the antenna side of the ATU and that will continually tell you the truth whereas your internal ATU will give a very good match as far as the VSWR meter in the transceiver is concerned because that VSWR meter is before the ATU. If you have an external a VSWR meter, then that's all always going to tell you the truth and it doesn't matter whether the ATU is in circuit or not. So coming back to measuring the uh, VSWR, measure the VSWR at three points. Measure it at the bottom of the band, the middle of the band and the top of the band and make a note and then measure it on each band and you'll get three points and you can just sort of draw a sort of curve. Now if you do that, it's possible that you may see what the problem is. You may find out, well, it's only on one band, therefore it could be a trap problem. Um, or they, they're they okay, but the best point is at the bottom of the band, or the best point is at the top of the band. That suggests that the antenna is not really quite resonant as it should be. And a lot of antennas um, have provision for making an adjustment. The good thing about this is if you have made those measurements on each band, you can actually draw a very crude curve for each band. And if you can't resolve it, you can take a copy of that, take a photo on your phone or whatever it is, and send it to the dealer so the dealer can then look at it and come up with perhaps some ideas and possibilities of where the problem lies. Occasionally, somebody will say, well, yeah, the antenna seems okay, the SWR is okay, but I'm not really working anything. Well, if that's the case, it's possible that either the band conditions are really bad or that the antenna is poorly sighted, or perhaps both. The easy way to check whether an antenna is working is to use the reverse beacon network and I've covered this in a previous video. Now reverse beacon is a very valuable tool to check out whether your signal is uh, getting enough or not and how well it's getting out. Go into, uh, go into your computer, type in reverse beacon and then select spot search. Now spot search enables you to check on propagation. What you need to do is you need to be able to send CW, but it doesn't really matter if you're not a CW operator. A lot of transceivers now will enable you to put a, a message into the, uh, into the uh, recording um, system on the transceiver. I'll show you how I've pre-programmed pre it into my KX2 here. And then go into reverse beacon, select spot search, and then type in your call sign. So if I type in GM3OJV, and up on the screen comes this, as you can see. Now, you can see that there's quite a few uh, stateside beacons that have spotted me, not too much uh, in the, the European direction, which really supports the fact that um, that. Uh, uh, mounting over there is acting as a reflector. It's a good way of knowing whether your antenna is actually radiating or not. One thing I haven't actually mentioned <laughs> is read the instructions um, because uh, some of these multiband antennas um, have uh, instructions which give you measurements and if you misread them or you make the incorrect adjustments then you will get VSWRs that don't look right. Um, and all I can say is read the instructions, recheck your measurements. And also, 
don't try and operate an antenna on a band that is not intended for it. You, sometimes I hear people say, well, I've got this XYZ antenna, which I operate on 27 megs or 28 megs or whatever. And it's okay, but when I try and operate it anywhere else, I get high SWR, well, it's to be expected because antennas, most antennas are resonant. Uh, there are a few exceptions, but most antennas are designed for certain bands and will only, only operate on those particular bands. So in summary, if you have an antenna problem, it's sensible to carry out these checks, these initial checks first of all. And particularly if it's sort of working but it doesn't seem to be quite right, do the SWR checks. Um, we as a dealer will value that because it gives, gives, us, it gives us two things. First of all, we know you've done the obvious checks. And secondly, with VSWR curves, you, you can look at it and you can think, wait a minute, I can see what's happening here, or I can see what is, I suspect is happening. Or the dealer will say, well, yes, it does look as if there's a problem with that antenna. But the reason I'm saying this is because it will save you time. It will make us able to give you a quicker answer. And hopefully, in most cases, you will find that the antenna probably is okay, but you, in your haste to get it up and get it in the air and so forth, if you hadn't really um, either read the instructions or hadn't thought it through, or you really are not that good at putting plugs on coax cable. So all I can say is make sure you've got an S, a, a, a little test meter, and it costs a few pounds, and I would strongly advise you get an external VSWR meter so that you can always see what's happening to your antenna, no matter whether the ATU is in circuit or not. There we are. That's, the, uh, that's what I wanted to say in this video. Um, it's not earth shattering, probably more applicable to beginners, but I hope it's um, uh, been of value anyway. And uh, as I say many times, thank you for watching these videos. I do. Um, um, appreciate you uh, you watching them and um, well magazines used to cost two shillings I'm not sure whether two shillings in 1965 was good value or not but um, magazine is still going there we are in the meantime take care enjoy your ham radio thanks for watching speak soon I've just received news from Spiderbeam in Germany that we're about to receive a couple of new Spiderbeam fiberglass telescopic masts. And the great thing about them is they telescope down just to 0.7 of a meter. That's just over two foot long. Yet one telescopes out to seven meters and the other one to a massive 10 meters. Great for portable operation. We shall have those in stock mid-February. Keep in touch. <laughs>